right, good afternoon. Everybody ready? Hey. All right, I'm Director Ron Lenvey uh, at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. I'm the Director of Investigations and Homeland Security. And I'm here to provide some uh, additional details and context to the officer-involved incident that we uh, reported on last night uh, as we investigated. So last night at uh, 8 or 9 p.m., police officers were called to 6925 Ortega Woods Drive in reference to a call for service concerning a kidnapping in progress. A 14-year-old female was sitting in her mother's car listening to music in the parking lot of her residence and was on her cell phone with another family member. An adult white male suspect walked up to the car where she was seated and surprised her while she was distracted with her activities in the car. He had his face partially covered by a bandana and pointed a handgun at her. He first demanded money from her, but she did not have any to give him. And he then pushed her over toward the passenger side of the car and got into the driver's seat and he drove off with her still in the car. The suspect drove approximately one mile before pulling over and forcing her out of the car, and then he then fled from the area in the vehicle that he had taken. The car was equipped with OnStar technology, and that aided responding officers in locating the vehicle about 40 minutes later near the intersection of San Juan and Lane Avenue. Two police officers blocked the stolen car in with their marked vehicles as OnStar worked to remotely disable the car. The suspect then exited the car with a firearm in his hand and did not comply with officers' commands for him to drop the gun as he walked in the roadway. The suspect turned toward an officer with the gun still in his hand and both officers opened fire on the suspect striking him. The officers rendered first aid to the suspect until a rescue arrived to take over that responsibility and rescue then transported him to the hospital. Medical intervention at the hospital was unsuccessful in saving the suspect and he died there. The two officers involved in this incident are identified as Officer B.L. Jester. He's been with the Sheriff's Office for two years and nine months. And Officer B.J. Langston, and he's been with us for three years and seven months. Both officers are assigned to the Community Problem Response Team, and this is the first officer involved shooting for both officers. Officer Langston fired nine rounds, and Officer Jester fired eight rounds. Both officers are currently on administrative leave at this time per our normal investigative protocols. The suspect in this case is 20-year-old Robert Emmett Bracewell Jr. He is a convicted felon who most recently did time for convictions on armed burglary and possession of a firearm by a delinquent felon and also for violating his probation. He was armed with a Glock Model 17 9mm handgun with an extended 30-round magazine that was fully loaded. Can see a picture of it there. His weapon was not fired. The suspect had multiple bullet strikes to his upper and lower body, but the medical examiner was unable to provide a specific count of bullet strikes at this time as they're still trying to differentiate between entrance and exit wounds. So in other words, one round can make more than one hole, so that makes it sometimes difficult for them, and they didn't want to um, put conjecture forth, and I don't want to do that either. Now, we're thankful that the young victim in this case was not physically injured during this crime. You can only imagine how traumatic it would be for a young person, 14 years old, to have to go through something like this. And our investigators are still working with her, and we're also setting her up with the victim's advocate to help her and her family through this difficult time. We continue to investigate the case with our investigative partners, uh, the state attorney's office who was with us last night, as well as the medical examiner's office, and FDLE will be processing our evidence. And we continue to interview potential witnesses and uh, locate additional evidence. Still an active and ongoing investigation, so I'm limited in the details that I can provide further than what I have, but I'll be happy to try to answer any of your questions that I can. Is there any indication at this point that the suspect and the victim knew each other? Yeah, there still is no further indication. There was none last night that they knew each other. It appears to be, he appears to be a stranger to the victim, and it you know, appears to be a crime of opportunity. She was in a parking lot in the car and um, you know based on the way he was armed and what he had to cover his face it looks like he was out looking for uh, an opportunity to commit a crime. How did you find out about this? Did she tell somebody on the phone she was on? Yes she was on the phone with a relative and uh, that relative relayed to another person in the house what she was being told who called the victim's mom who called 911. Just to be clear you didn't actually point the gun at an officer to your knowledge? That's still under being still being investigated, so I'm not going to say definitively in one way or another because I don't have that information. He turned toward the officer with the gun in his hand, but it is exactly where it was pointed or how it was extended. I don't have that information. Any idea what he did in the 40 minutes between dropping the girl off or 
confronting the girl at the apartment and when he was confronted by officers? We'll be working with OnStar to try to, you know, detail the path that he went on. That, that information should hopefully be chronicled in their system since it's a satellite navigation system as well. Um, but I don't have all the details on that at this point in time. Approximately where was the 14-year-old? Um, it was eight tenths of a mile, roughly, from the scene, and I say roughly because, once again, as streets are, it depends on exactly which route you take to get there. So somewhere about a mile away. How common landing was here? Um, there was it was a couple of side streets. I don't have them in front of me exactly where that was that she was dropped off. The OnStar system seems to have been a big help to you guys. How often sure. Um, you know, a lot of stolen vehicles are typically recovered. Um, it's been a little, we have certainly have had successes with it before. It's been a little while since I've been made aware of one, but, um, you know, the satellite technology is, is great. We all use it as a convenience when we travel, certainly, and it can help law enforcement, um, you know, in the same regard when you, when you get into a situation like this. Typically the way that works is through our communications center and they relay information to the officers that they're getting from the company. Now the company has protocols of which I don't have all in front of me right now. Um, before they'll give information to law enforcement, they have to verify with the victim that their vehicle has actually been stolen. So there are some processes. It's not instantaneous, but, um, but uh, it worked very well last night and we were able to get that. statement last night was that you were, had contacted, I guess, OnStar to shut the vehicle off. Did you shut it off? Did you cause him to jump out? Or had that not happened? That we're still sorting through the fine details on that. As the vehicle was located and OnStar was working to shut it down, the officers were moving in to block him at the same time. So um, we're not completely sure if it was actually disabled by OnStar, but those are some of the details we'll be working with through them as well. But um, you know, there was minimal damage on on any of the vehicles that were involved. So you know, you could the conjecture would be that they were able to disable it, but I just don't want to say it. conclusively. Wow. Yeah, because he was definitely blocked in by the police cars too. How close was he to the officers before they fired? Now, I don't have all the measurements that the ETs do as far as the uh, crime scene reporting that. It's very detailed and it takes some time to complete, so I just I don't have that information. Can you touch on the truth of how is that 14-year-old going to um, I'm told she's doing as, as well as can be expected under the circumstances, obviously, with family. Um, you know, it's, it, as an adult, it's hard to imagine going through an experience like that, and, you know, to do that as a child, a 14-year-old, Really, it's, uh, it's very difficult to imagine anyone that age having to go through that. But that's why we're going to you know, work through our advocates here as well to make sure that she and her family have the support that they need to work through it the best they can. I wish we could take it, take it away and that it never happened, but unfortunately it did. So we want to try to help the family deal with it the best we can. To be clear, did he come to a stop before letting her out of the car or did she push the car That's one of those details that I'm still, you know, we're still narrowing down to be exactly certain whether the car stopped or was it moving a little bit. I just don't know, so I don't want to give you a, an incorrect answer to that question. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Thanks.